selling to the world's best investor, or how to pitch your company to the best investor in the world in 30 seconds or less, as I walked past the Plaza Hotel near 58th Street and 5th Avenue on a glorious May morning in 1994, I heard someone call out, Warren Buffett. Turning in the direction of the voice, I saw a woman in a bright red dress stop Buffett on the sidewalk and start a friendly conversation with him. Buffett, dressed comfortably in an off-the-rack suit, listened patiently to the woman, who, it turned out, was a shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway, Buffett's hugely successful company. At the time, the legendary investor was the second richest man in the United States, and a share of Berkshire stock was about $20,000. As it happened, I was in New York that day to meet with our financial advisors at Morgan Stanley to talk about our company, which at the time operated 143 jewelry stores nationwide, more than 245 now. Personally, I felt uncomfortable expanding the company beyond my ability to know every store manager on a first-name basis. We had grown well beyond that point, and we were still growing. We had no interest in going public. We didn't want to be pressured to pay more attention to quarterly earnings and stock price than to the long-term operational health of the company and the well-being of our associates. We certainly didn't want some financial butcher carving up this jewel and selling it piecemeal. I also didn't want my associates spitting on my grave. As the woman said her goodbyes and turned to go, and as Buffett prepared to cross the street, I saw my own opportunity. 15. Stepped forward and thrust out my hand. Hello, Mr. Buffett, I said. I'm Barnett Hellsberg of Hellsberg Diamonds in Kansas City. I didn't sense any recognition in his face, but he politely shook my hand and said hello back, willing, if not eager, to hear me out. Then, right there on the sidewalk, as busy New Yorkers rushed past us and street traffic buzzed around us, I told one of the most astute businessmen in America why he ought to consider buying our family's 79-year-old jewelry business, headquartered in North Kansas City, Missouri. I believe that our company matches your criteria for investment, I said. To which he replied, simply, send me the information. It will be confidential. My conversation with Buffett lasted no more than half a minute. In fact, the account of my sidewalk pitch to Buffett was featured in the January 2002 issue of Harvard Management Communication Letter as an example of the classic elevator pitch, which entails selling your idea in the time it takes to ride an elevator three stories. My idea, of course, was to grab his attention. How often do you encounter Warren Buffett on a sidewalk and pique his curiosity in your family company? As I walked away, however, I wondered whether my approach might have seemed abrupt, if not downright presumptuous. Yet, I felt certain that our successful, three-generation family business made a perfect fit with Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, which Fortune magazine has repeatedly named as one of the ten most respected companies in America. In 1994, Berkshire's $11.9 billion net worth was greater than Coca-Cola and PepsiCo combined. It was a collection of 30 businesses including such signature names as Seize Candy, World Book, and Nebraska Furniture Mart. It was the largest shareholder in Gillette, Coca-Cola, and the American Express Company. To be sure, if you're looking for a gauge to measure how well your company has grown and developed, and how well your management has led and cared for your company's associates, you can't do any better than to find yourself in a situaxi selling to the world's best investor. Shin where Warren Buffett wants to buy it? And that's just the situation in which we found ourselves in 1994. Imagine our gut-busting pride when, as the third-generation owners of Hellsberg, Buffett later explained why he decided to buy our business, we associate ourselves with some real jewels of the American business world. And I think it's quite fitting that Hellsberg joins this collection of jewels. It's just exactly the kind of company we like to invest in. It's got outstanding management. It's got a leadership position. It's on the move. I would hate to compete with you fellows. I'd rather be on your side of the fence.
And that's the side we're going to be on. My dream buyer for the family business all along was Warren Buffett. I knew we could trust him to keep the headquarters in Kansas City, resist changing the company's character, and retain the jobs of all of Hellsberg's associates. It might have been simpler to sell to the highest bidder, but that notion seemed as sensible as choosing a brain surgeon based on the lowest price rather than on talent and reputation. I had purchased four shares of Berkshire Hathaway stock in 1989 just so I could attend Berkshire's annual meetings and pick up some of Buffett's wisdom. His presentations are warm and unpretentious. He genuinely enjoys people. He's often quoted saying, great people do great things. He also likes to say, we only buy companies that we trust. That certainly proved to be true when he bought Hellsberg Diamonds. My first visit to a Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting was quite a revelation and taught me a great deal about Warren Buffett and his philosophies. My notes included, hire seven-footers, that is, hire people with incredible abilities. Another very, very strong impression was obtained through an answer he gave a Kellogg Business School student who asked, how do I determine which job to take? Warren's answer was simply, get a job you love at a company you respect. His people orientation was obvious and since I had been taught from day one by my dad that business is people, this was most impressive. Selling to the world's best investor 17. Buffett recounted the story of how he acquired our company to shareholders this way, Barnett said he had a business we might be interested in. When people say that, it usually turns out they have a lemonade stand with potential, of course, to quickly grow into the next Microsoft. So I simply asked Barnett to send me particulars. That, I thought to myself, will be the end of that. In fact, it did almost end there. I promptly went home and sent Buffett nothing, afflicted with hang-ups about confidentiality. I'm the kind of guy who asks for someone's social security number before I tell them the time. But one night I reread the chairman's letter in the Berkshire annual report. There was Buffett again inviting companies that meet his acquisition criteria to send him information, and he would promise complete confidentiality. While shaving the next morning, I looked at the slow learner in the mirror and began to scold myself for procrastinating. He told you in person it would be confidential. He told you in writing. Do you want it set to music? Send him the information. So I finally did. Not long after we sent Buffett our financial information, he called us up and told us he wanted to talk. He said we were a lot like Berkshire, which to me was the ultimate compliment. Soon we were in his office in Omaha negotiating a sale. His incredible diplomacy was strongly evident during our visit. Our CPA from Deloitte and Touche told him the incredibly high price that we had come up with for the business, based on what he had paid for another company. I recall he had no reaction even though it was actually about double the price that he ultimately paid. I am sure Mr. Buffett and I both thought it was ridiculously high. This can be the fastest deal in history, Buffett said. But what about due diligence? I asked surprised at how fast the negotiations were moving. Most suitors demand to see every scrap of paper you've ever generated and to interview every top manager. That wasn't Buffett's way. I can smell these things, Buffett said. This one smells good 18 selling to the world's best investor. That would not be my last surprise. I asked about a non-compete clause. You'll certainly want that, won't you? I asked. Buffett shrugged. You wouldn't do anything to hurt this company, he said. When a guy says that to you, he has you on your honor for the rest of your life. When Buffett buys a company, he's not looking for a quick resale to make a buck. He told us, someone asked one time what my favorite holding period for securities is and I said forever. And that's exactly the way we feel about our businesses. When we were ready to leave his office and asked if a cab could be called, he insisted on walking us to the elevator, riding it down with us, and standing on the street to wait with us for the cab. Typical Buffett treatment. 
Our poor cab driver was desperate to know what company we were with. I finally fibbed and said we were with a hardware retailer. Warren Buffett's approach to purchasing companies is very straightforward. He will give an answer immediately if he has any interest, and he will immediately give you a non-negotiable price. A close friend whose company he bought was told by his attorney that there are seven things the attorney puts in every acquisition contract on behalf of a client who is to be acquired. When Berkshire purchased my friend's business, he requested none of these because they were already in the contract. That tells one a great deal about the character of Warren Buffett. His is a vitally important role model in the landscape of American business, proving that nice guys can finish first, or second after Bill Gates. After buying Hellsberg, Buffett explained to his shareholders that our ownership structure enables sellers to know that when I say we are buying to keep, the promise means something. For our part, he continued, we like dealing with owners who care what happens to their companies and people. A buyer is likely to find fewer unpleasant surprises dealing with that type of seller than with one simply auctioning off his business. Easy to say, but Buffett makes it work. How? By buying companies with smart and intuitive leaders and then staying out selling to the world's best investor 19. Of their way. When he bought us, Buffett's empire of 22,000 associates was overseen by only 11 people at his Omaha headquarters. No micromanagement there. And talk about trust. Explaining how he makes this hands-off approach work, Buffett said that it was because the managers operate with total autonomy and they do such a terrific job we really don't need anyone to supervise them. Managers run their own shows. They don't have to report to central management, he said. When we get somebody who is a .400 hitter we don't start telling them how to swing. True to his word, Buffett didn't change a hair in the leadership of Hellsberg. He was happy with the company's leadership under Jeff Comment, formerly president of Wanamaker's. Jeff was our kind of manager, Buffett would later say, adding, in fact, we would not have bought the business if Jeff had not been there to run it. Buying a retailer without good management is like buying the Eiffel Tower without an elevator. Buffett's purchase of Hellsberg Diamonds validated the painstaking efforts by our family, along with so many wonderful associates, to build a national operation of profitable customer-focused jewelry stores second to none for providing quality, value, and service. The national recognition of our efforts was flattering. In a November 1994 industry report, Goldman Sachs called Hellsberg Diamonds the Nordstrom of the jewelry business. The report noted that Hellsberg's average per store sales of more than $1.7 million in 1994 was nearly double the industry average. Goldman Sachs said Hellsberg set the standard of excellence for other jewelers in its market niche, selling to middle and upper middle class consumers. The report concluded that just as other department stores have had to learn to compete with Nordstrom, so other credit jewelry companies will develop strategies to compete effectively with Hellsberg. Berkshire was then one of about a dozen companies in the United States that had a AAA rating from Standard and Poor's. Buffett told us after our negotiations, you are associated with XX selling to the world's best investor. A company that is really regarded as one of the bluest of blue chips. And in associating with Hellsbergs we know we have joined with another company that, in its own field, is comparably regarded. I couldn't think of a more gracious thing to say. I think if my dad, Barnett Sr., and grandfather, Morris, had still been alive, they too would feel proud and comfortable that our family business, which started in 1915 from a single store in Kansas City, Kansas, and had grown by 1994 into a group of 143 stores in 23 states, with total sales of $282 million, was in capable hands. As Buffett himself finally described the deal that began on a New York sidewalk, we weren't talking lemonade stands. Mining for diamonds diamond suit dad told us that the higher you go, the nicer they get. Mr. Buffett exemplifies that rule. Diamond suit consider using fair contracts rather than one where the other party thinks you are playing gotcha. Berkshire does. 
Diamond suit class and business success are not mutually exclusive. Diamond suit for a priceless educational opportunity by one share of Berkshire Hathaway B stock so after you get the annual report, available on the web to all, you can go to the annual meeting, for shareholders only. Some claim that one Berkshire meeting is more valuable than a semester-long MBA class. Selling to the world's best investor XXI. Know thyself, what it takes to be an entrepreneur. My father was 14 when he took over the family business. My grandfather, Morris Helsberg, had a stroke and there was no one else to run the little jewelry shop in Kansas City, Kansas. His brother Morton was in dental school and another brother, Gilbert, was headed to World War I duty. Because dad was in school, the family persuaded an uncle to watch the store each day until dad arrived from school. I don't believe my father ever questioned the family's decision. The evidence indicates he took to the task naturally, with true entrepreneurial drive. He was a born salesman, regularly staying at the shop past closing time just to help one more customer. His teacher became concerned that the focus was shifting from school to work and one day demanded, Barnett, where do you study your lessons? Dad innocently replied, on the streetcar, to the great amusement of his classmates. At 17, Dad moved the business into a larger, grander building and with the high spirits of youth proclaimed himself a diamond merchant. The shop sold the same mix of rings and watches as everyone else, but the label let the world know he had big plans for himself and the family business. During the Depression he became a symbol of courage and positive thinking for the embattled community when he doubled the size of our Kansas City, Missouri, store in 1932. He nurtured and demanded that same positive drive to succeed, whatever the challenges, in his three sons. Dad gave me summertime employment when I was 15. I wasn't sure what to expect. A timid and obedient child, I only asked Dad not to make me sell anything. Fat chance. Dad knew XXIII. The importance of learning by doing, so of course, I started by selling. My love for it began after the exhilaration of my first sale, which I think was a radio, and I took rejections in stride. I was smitten with the customer interaction and the ensuing relationship that resulted. Modest as that first sale was, I began to have confidence that I could do this. It wasn't work, it was fun. At the end of the summer I placed in the top 10 in a company-wide watch sales contest. I had not yet earned the right to sell diamonds. I was an entrepreneur, master of my own destiny. I could do whatever I set my mind to. Anything was possible. I can't tell you where other entrepreneurs get their drive, but I'll bet many catch the bug young like I did. The feeling that you are your own boss, that your future is in your hands, is a frightening and thrilling prospect. I became president of Hellsberg Diamonds in 1962 at age 29, when my father became ill and asked me to take over. I was nervous and definitely not ready, but I did so with absolute backing from dad and the entire family. It wasn't always smooth, but it was always interesting. I made mistakes and had my share of failures, but my enthusiasm and the backing of my family never wavered. All successful people have failures. How many times did you fall before you could walk? I'm told Babe Ruth struck out 1,330 times, but he's remembered for hitting 714 home runs. Despite missteps, entrepreneurs are a special breed who do not give up on the larger goals. The late Ewing Kaufman, a mentor of mine, founder of Marion Laboratories and former owner of the Kansas City Royals baseball team, became a pharmaceutical salesman in the 1950s and turned his love for people into a phenomenal success. He beat every quota and earned more than the boss. The next year the boss reduced his territory. Up to the challenge, Kaufman sold even more, again earning more than the boss. The next year, his boss cut his commission. By then, Kaufman had had enough. He quit and started his own pharmaceutical business, packaging his own products in his basement and self sieve know thyself, what it takes to be an entrepreneur.
buying them from the trunk of his car. In 1989, Kaufman sold Marion Labs to Merrill Dow for $6.5 billion. Not everyone wants to become a Ewing Kaufman, though some will. I see young entrepreneurs every day in our Hellsberg Entrepreneurial Mentoring Program, a program for less experienced entrepreneurs to be matched up with more experienced entrepreneurs, who have similar dreams and drive, people who prefer to take their futures into their own hands. No one has an easy prescription to become a successful entrepreneur. If they say they do, they're fibbing. It takes a lot of luck, which often translates into seeing and seizing opportunities before someone else does. Entrepreneurs come in every shape, size, gender, and socioeconomic background. Some were entrepreneurs from the moment they opened their first lemonade stand. Others became entrepreneurs out of necessity, they got laid off or fired, or they fired their boss and got out of a bad situation. Downsizing creates armies of new entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are driven to succeed. They possess an almost naive belief that nothing can stand in their way, they are mentally deaf to those who belittle their chances, they love to compete, and they have the skills of broken field runners who take the bumps and bruises along the way, change course when necessary, and stay focused on the goal. If this is not you, don't try to fool yourself. It's not worth it. Thinking you can start your own business or wanting to be your own boss, just because you hate your job, when you really have no desire or stamina to go it on your own, is courting disaster. Where there is no real will, there is no way. Some aren't willing to pay the price of giving up some time with their families. The choice is far from obvious, but to some there is no choice when something grabs them by the nape of the neck and drags them into the ring. According to government statistics, about a million businesses start each year, and more than half fail within the first two years because of poor financing, lack of management discipline, and slash or entrepreneurial skills. Some people are more know thyself, what it takes to be an entrepreneur xxv. Enamored by the concept than the reality. They would rather contemplate the beauty of the mountain from the base. The entrepreneur wants to climb the mountain first, briefly appreciate the gorgeous vistas from the summit, and then find the next mountain. If you possess this obsession of seeing your own creative notion succeed and are willing to pay the price, whether starting your own business or expanding and improving an existing one, then you have no choice but to pursue the life of an entrepreneur. My own particular motivation included an obsession with proving wrong the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations myth. More than 22 million small businesses already exist in America. They account for 99% of all American businesses. They employ 53% of the private workforce and contribute over half of the nation's private gross domestic product. All that goes to show entrepreneurs are successful every day, and they provide real benefits to their community and nation. You can be a success if you want it badly enough. Today's prospective entrepreneurs are far more thoughtful than many of my generation. Those I have contact with seem to have a mature grasp of the need to know their strengths and weaknesses and to measure the pluses and minuses before they plunge into a venture. They think carefully about the price to be paid in family time and working hours. There is no magic formula or litmus test, you just need to realize the depth of the commitment. However, you can draw general conclusions about successful entrepreneurs, decisive, they rely on intuition, street smarts, and even gut feel. They can catch on to big ideas without having to go through the logic and details that slow others down. Risk takers, they calculate odds but at the same time are quick to get off the dime. If action carries downside risks, it comes at a price they are willing to pay. Persistent, failure is written off as down payment against the success they believe will come if they simply keep at it. They always have a plan B, if not X, Y, or Z, X, X, V, I know thyself, what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Tough-minded, they may dream of big breakthroughs, but they live in the real world when it comes to keeping score on results. They need to know what works in order to refigure the odds for the next trial run. Independent, they prefer to march to their own drumbeat, 
often turning out to be harder on themselves than any boss. Money sensitive, cash in the till is one clear message that whatever they tried worked out poorly or well. The best of them understand that profit is opinion but cash is fact. Never satisfied, as fast as they get wherever they've been trying to go, they come up with a new set of itches to replace the old ones. They are perpetually just getting started no matter how successful they become. Passionate, they love what they are doing. Time moves quickly for them. They are exempt from boredom. In addition to the characteristics listed above, successful entrepreneurs tend to have a certain set of competencies on an emotional level. They, like being the leader. Enjoy being the boss. Take criticism and rejection well. Want to know how they can improve to be successful. Know their strengths and weaknesses. Know when and where they need help. Know the wisdom of hiring people with strengths in their own areas of weakness. Don't let criticisms or setbacks get in the way of relationships. Are willing to work for the most demanding, unreasonable boss ever, themselves. Are willing to work hard, exhibiting the discipline necessary to make a success. Are willing to pay the very high price of lost time with family. Know thyself, what it takes to be an entrepreneur XXVII. Are willing initially to make smaller earnings, hopefully for a limited time. At the bottom line, entrepreneurs fashion their ideas into a business. They, differentiate, they know how to make an idea stand out from others in the marketplace. Live finance, they understand the need to find sufficient funding to grow and maintain the business. Execute, they use a combination of skills, guts, and luck to bring everything together and make it work. Entrepreneurs may not be all that easy to live with when it comes to patience or teamwork. They aren't likely to spend much time figuring out how to win friends. They can be workaholics. It can be easy to misread them as impractical dreamers, even con artists. Yet, in the final analysis they are the ones capable of providing jobs, security, and income for others on the lookout for a spot from which to participate in the American dream. Without entrepreneurs, the business scene becomes bland and repetitive, so that even the bureaucrats find themselves wishing for someone with the courage and smarts to make something interesting happen. Even so, you don't have to start a business in order to be an entrepreneur. I certainly did not. Some people inherit small businesses or are thrust into leadership in them like I was. Others run entrepreneurial departments within larger enterprises. The ideas in this book will help those entrepreneurs, too. If you decide after reading this that this is not the life for you, then you also have received timely advice. After all this, do you still want to be an entrepreneur? I hope so. If so, I support and salute you. My own business experience has taught me that it can be the greatest job in the world. Sure, there will be bumps, but then as Yogi reminded us, it ain't over till it's over. And the ecstasies have a way of overbalancing the agonies. That's what dad would tell you, and as we all know, father knows best xxvii I know thyself, what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Part I Managing one when growing up, I was intrigued that my father only concerned himself with those business elements that were controllable. He refused to acknowledge the depression and did quite well during that period. He was unwilling to talk about recessions or 20-inch snowfalls. He only thought about and talked about those conditions within his control. I saw this daily in Dad's actions. I never knew when the country was in a recession because Dad wouldn't talk about it. People would suggest we close the store on Labor Day because everyone would be out of town. He'd say, how many will be gone? Of course, we'd stay open and do just fine. Dad was a great believer in not sweating the small stuff. He taught us to concern ourselves only with those things over which we have control. I thought he was unique in this until I realized this is one of the key common traits of highly successful people. Those folks are never victims. They take what comes and handle the situation. The rest is a waste of time. Behave chosen pogo the possum, 
the clever creation of cartoonist Walt Kelly, as my patron saint. Pogo said, we have met the enemy and they is us. This philosophy allows little room for blaming others, but it can certainly lead to success. James Carville, Democratic campaign strategist in 1992, also agrees with Pogo, that's the smartest thing said in the history of concerning yourself with only the controllables Hellsberg Hint 3. Men, he noted several years ago, as quoted in a Time magazine article. The deal only with the controllables philosophy helps you focus your attention where it ought to be. Keeping this principle in mind helps save time and resources. After all, if you can't do anything about a problem, just move on. You cannot always control circumstances, but you can control your own thoughts. Charles Popplestone worry is interest on money never borrowed. Anonymous mining for diamonds diamond suit deal only with controllables. Diamond suit never be a victim. Diamond suit paint yourself in a corner with one choice to be successful. For managing. To the most understandable measure of value in diamonds is size. Everyone understands that a 1 carat diamond is bigger than a 1 2 carat diamond, so that is the consumer's basic orientation. Amazingly, Dad approached this marketing situation 180 degrees differently than nearly every other jeweler in the United States. As you read this, please keep in mind that our customers at that time were folks of very moderate incomes. His concept was that he refused to sell a diamond solid here in an engagement ring that was not perfect, that is, internally flawless, with good color, good cut, and absolute clarity. As he struggled for a name for this concept, he picked up a box of baking soda on which he read, this baking soda is certified to be perfect. Thus, Hellsberg certified perfect diamonds. The result was that when the customer entered our store, the diamonds were actually smaller for the money. We explained to them that they were absolutely perfect and were the finest money could buy, and we felt that as a symbol of love they owed this to their bride. What did this do? First and foremost in my own heart, I believe the biggest thing it did was create pride within our associates at every level of the company, knowing that we had a totally unique stance and refused to sell any other quality in diamond solid ears. It showed tremendous respect for customers who weren't used to being treated that way. Making your business different Hellsberg Hint 5 It also created a unique selling proposition at Hellsberg Diamonds and made us dramatically different. It gave us the opportunity to tell our customer across the counter, you don't have to buy at Hellsberg's, but we strongly suggest you get a perfect diamond. Since virtually nobody else carried them for most of those years, this was a wonderful and unique reason for the customer to shop at Hellsberg Diamonds. We created our own market. Rather than being in the diamond market, we created the perfect diamond market. Far larger than the Hellsberg certified perfect diamond concept was the kind of tone it set in the organization. I feel this was probably the greatest single strategy decision Dad ever made. Years later when it became nearly impossible to get certified perfect quality in certain stones, I went to him with a number of reasons to change our policy. I pointed out to him that we had not been able to buy a certified perfect Marquise diamond for a two-year period, and the fact that our business was grading up and many of these customers wanted larger stones for the money. Because of my good reasons and undoubtedly in great part because I was his son, he blessed the plan. As it turned out this decision was fortuitous, in addition to the reasons I'd given him that day, certified perfect diamonds became virtually extinct in many markets of the world diamond trade. Some other unique and unusual techniques Dad used were, one he set a policy absolutely refusing to negotiate prices on merchandise, though not unique, it was highly unusual. Two further, he demanded we treat all customers with respect and that, in many cases, created an unparalleled loyalty. I can actually remember a customer who came in and begged me to order him a television set, although we didn't sell televisions, because he did not want to open an account at any other store. 3. Another idea, which many people have never forgotten to this very day, was the Teenage Watch Club. The 6. Managing
Advertising told teenagers that they could come in with parents' permission and purchase any watch up to $50 and establish their own credit without anyone else signing for them. The ad stated, there is nothing legally binding in this procedure. We always secured the parents' permission and made many friends this way. To illustrate the power of this concept, the policeman who stopped my brother for speeding said to him, how could I give a ticket to someone who gave me my very first chance to establish credit? Generally, credit is based on where you have had credit, and this creates a catch-22 situation for most folks since there seems to be no way to get credit unless you have credit references. Who do you think these young folks thought of first a few years later when engagement time came? Many years later I started to realize how very powerful that particular concept was. As in many people's experience, the older you get, the smarter your parents get. Mining for diamonds diamond suit find ways to separate yourself from the competition. Show a clear, definable difference. Diamond suit principles build your business, not the profit motive. Diamond suit entrepreneurs should always be massaging a successful formula in looking for ways to improve and to be up to date in building differences from the competition. Diamond suit if you are in a crowded, competitive market, create your own market, that is, not the diamond market, the perfect diamond market, not the beef market, the Angus beef market, not the beer market, the freshest beer market. Diamond suit be different and better. You need a unique selling proposition. Diamond Suit Remember the tremendous benefits to spirit and morale when you operate with principles your associates can be especially proud of. Making your business different 7. Bigger is not better, better is better Vivian Jennings, Rainy Day Books, a community bookstore, Fairway Kansas 8 Managing. 3. When you are operating a group of retail stores, there is always the usual bell curve of weak to great performing stores. At one point we were struggling with a store doing $800,000 in volume and through gargantuan efforts trying to get to $850,000 in annual sales. Much conventional practice dictates committing great effort to the weakest segment. When I discussed this with my friend Steve Lieberman of Minneapolis, the hot dog magnate who ran hundreds of carousel snack bars in shopping centers for many years, he said, you make more money closing bad stores than opening new ones. His philosophy made sense. We decided we would rather spend time and effort on a $4.5 million store that could ultimately achieve annual sales of $6 million than on a lower volume store with less potential. Did this mean we gave up immediately when things did not work? Absolutely not, if the store lacked great people, proper merchandising, or other controllable variables, by all means we fixed it. However, our attitude became to upgrade the herd annually, closing the weakest stores each year. Each activity you undertake exacts the price of not being able to pursue alternative activities, sometimes called opportunity cost. You are investing the time and talents of your associates. What is the actual cost of sending a highly talented person to create an average performance out of a dry well highest and best use of your time Hellsberg hint 9. Rather than sending him or her to a gusher that can be turned into a super gusher. The cost is far more than the cost of that individual. Thus, the cost of putting out fires where problems exist and putting fingers in dikes where leaks exist is extremely high in the sense of decreased progress or missed opportunities. Peter Drucker calls that feeding the problems and starving the opportunities. The temptation is to devote oneself to fixing the problems that cry out for fixing, but feeding the opportunities can be so much more profitable. The question, is what I am doing bringing me closer to my objective, should be restated as, is what I am doing bringing me closer to my objective than an alternate activity that I could be doing. Because of their semi-permanency and their unlimited parasitic appetite, underperforming operations destroy the good people you send there for turnaround while simultaneously depriving those great managers and great teammates of an exciting opportunity as well as putting capital to non-productive uses. Management's challenge is to take advantage of the unlimited opportunity to focus the talents of its most talented people on winners. 
Riding the winners to success was what created the large average sales volume of the Hellsberg Diamond stores. Perhaps one of the key reasons Warren Buffett has been the world's most successful investor he does not buy turnaround opportunities, only successful companies. Concentrating on winners will help maximize your profits and make your life a whole lot more fun. What greater excitement than riding those winners to the finish line and getting that garland of roses? It sure beats moving poor performers up to mediocre. Focus is your lever to success. As the leader you need to be sure you and your team are doing the right things, and as managers they need to be doing things right. Doing the right things is the leadership component that is clearly up to you. The doing things right component is the province of the managers to whom you have delegated the responsibility. Anything that 10 managing. Decreases focus on these right things inhibits progress. Investing unlimited effort in failing projects does not create success. Do not underestimate the incredible amount of mental discipline it takes to focus yourself and your teammates. Wonderful alternatives and seductive opportunities abound and temptations to go in multiple directions are unlimited. Of course, consistently working on the basics can get boring, especially when things are going well. Why not open a print shop or sign shop, do your own payroll, or engage in a myriad of services to save money? Such temptations take you away from the constant improvement needed in your core business to be the best in your industry. Commit yourself to be the best, define what that means, and focus on the head of that pin like no one in your industry. Have a clear simple objective, let your team develop the roadmap, and go for it. Less is more. L. E. Corbusier, 1887-1965, Swiss architect mining for diamonds Diamond suit are you focusing on your core business, where you are best? Diamond suit are you eliminating activities that decrease your focus? Diamond suit are you focusing on the fewest, most powerful opportunities? Diamond suit less is truly more when you are committed to the right less. Diamond suit to win. Focus on achievers the right people matched with top opportunities. Highest and best use of your time 11. 12 for after purchasing my new car, I was going through the material that came with it. The message on the instructional cassette tape was, you should never take your car through an automatic car wash, and in the handbook it stated, you can take your car through an automatic car wash. I called the auto dealer's S service department to ask which was correct the cassette tape or the handbook. The serviceman responded, please bring your car in because we would prefer to wash it for you at no charge. Arriving at the dealership, I discovered that from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., six days a week, the company washes customers' cars at no charge whatsoever. I was hoping it would have a waiting room where one could rent and buy a diet Coca-Cola. I found not only a waiting room, but free Diet Cokes. When I asked if there was a phone I could use, I was told there were two. One phone offered was in a private office. The company offered exceptional service. Yes, they bought my soul offering free car washes and free Diet Coke. This tripled my enjoyment of my car. In the past I went to the dealership only when the car needed service or to look at a new car. Rare and not always pleasant. With the additional services they saw me a lot more often and in a far brighter mood. I am looking forward to my next auto purchase and will certainly shop there. Super service, friend to the entrepreneur Hellsberg hint. That same day I went to the grocery store to get a few items. Unloading the groceries, I found that the home phone numbers of the owners, Mike and Libby, were listed right on the sack with the invitation to call if I was not happy with the store. In addition to the signs they had around the store about making me a happy customer, they proved they meant it. It was clear that the owners took responsibility for good service. Although I had no reason to call the owners about the grocery store service, the information and statement on the sack certainly made me believe that they cared. Al and Nancy acquired their TCBY yogurt franchise on May 15, 1996. By summer 2002, the volume had virtually doubled. Long lines of customers patiently wait to be served. 
Why did the business double in the same location and with the same merchandise and no particular local economic miracles? Here are Nancy's thoughts, it comes down to serving the customer, giving them full attention, not posting hours and staying open later if people are still coming in, putting up a community bulletin board, which of course includes pictures of Emma, our first grandchild, helping seniors to read the menus, instructing our staff to memorize five names a week, tell the customer your name and ask theirs, explaining that you are working to memorize five names per week if I forget when you come back. I will give you a free topping, family involvement with our son, Jess, and his wife running the store sometimes. There is lots of training that goes on with staff so they know our expectations. They build relationships my cousin George called me telling me Nancy gave him the news about my grandson-to-be before I could. There is always a cheery greeting and a question like how is your school doing? Super service, friend to the entrepreneur 13. 14 Managing Nancy and Al have turned down some offers of multiple locations, preferring to build a small gold mine rather than a large silver mine. They may consider a second store in the future. I'll bet Jess and his wife will run one or the other. You can bet that as a steady customer, I sure hope Al and Nancy don't leave me. Great service exists fortunately for entrepreneurs it's a rarity. What an opportunity for the ambitious until super service becomes commonplace, it never will. Remember super service is in the eye of the beholder and it need not be expensive. Remembering the customer's name and the customer's needs and just showing an attitude of wanting to help rather than just selling the customer can build the loyalty you are looking for. How about a nice handwritten note out of the blue thanking them for paying promptly or just thanking them for their business? At Hellsberg Diamonds we were happy to clean rings in our ultrasonic machines for our visitors and replace watch batteries free. The actual doing of these things is not really the point. I always said to know our people is to love them. The way these services are rendered makes the difference, not the service itself. I prefer bad food and good service to good food and bad service. For a great book of horror stories and success stories about customer service, you'll enjoy Waymish, Why Are You Making It So Hard, For Me To Give You My Money, by Ted Cohn and Ray Considine. You can provide outstanding service and own your customer. It will make everyone's job more fun. It will build your business. Great entrepreneurs recognize the goal is the total customer experience, not just the quality and price of goods or services purchased or given. Now for the key question, how do you get it done in your organization? You need to give positive reinforcement to those who render great service to the customer. At Hellsberg Diamonds I sent personal handwritten notes to the folks who got great cuz. Tomer comments thanking them, and those notes found their way to the bulletin boards and stayed up quite a while. When I went to get my auto repaired, the service representative who introduced himself told me the factory would be writing me regarding his service quality. When I picked up my car, the manager had a note on the invoice that if any of my grades of the service were under 5 to let him know. The other side of the coin is that you must jump very quickly on the wrong kind of customer service and promote a three strikes and you re-out mentality and never accept less than the best in customer treatment from your staff. That must be built in as one of the absolutes of your business culture. The quality of customer service is not negotiable. Max's Law's Copyright 1 This restaurant is run for the enjoyment and pleasure of our customers not the convenience of the staff or the owners. Do you get a free round of drinks if any one of our staff comes up and says, is everything all right? When we ask questions, they'll be good ones. Mining for diamonds diamond suit bad service at your competitors provides unlimited opportunity for you. Cash in. Diamond suit exceed your customers' expectations, under promise over deliver. Diamond suit make building loyalty, long-term customer value, not just satisfaction, your prime goal. Diamond suit reward and reinforce good customer service. Diamond suit use a three strikes and you re-out policy on employee retention when poor customer service is rendered. Super service, friend to the entrepreneur 15.
3. You must get your mustard and ketchup before your burger, sandwich, or fries. 4. We hate soggy fries. If yours aren't crisp, the way you like them send them back maybe the kitchen will get the message. 5. Corned beef and pastrami are good because they contain some fat, however, with today's dietary consciousness, our corned beef and pastrami are now extra lean. So ask for a little fat for that traditional taste. If you want something with no fat, how about our turkey or turkey pastrami? 6. The turkey is always fresh. Period. 7. Our iced tea is table brewed. Just pour it over a big glass of ice. 8. You'll love our breads and pastries. They are made fresh daily in Max's bakery and kitchen. 9. Warning, we bake our own sourdough crusty as can be. If you like soft bread, eat the middle. 10. Our ice cream sauces are a point of pride. They're made in New York by a certified chocoholic who refuses therapy. They are simply the best in the country. And we don't boast idly. 11. We bring ice cream sauces from New York City. Eat here. Save the airfare. 12. This is a bad place for a diet and a good place for a diet. 13. Our desserts are excessive because nothing succeeds like excess. We encourage sharing if you're not super hungry. 14. Substitutions are okay by us. Don't be bashful. You've got a mouth. Use it. 15. We use cholesterol-free oil for frying and sautéing. Anything can be grilled fat-free. 16. If you are a single diner and are greeted with the expression, just one, dinner is on us. 16. Managing. 17. We agree that the customer is always right. If there is a problem with your food or service, call for the manager will fix it in a flash. But, if you finish your plate it couldn't have been all that bad. Now, could it? Super service. Friend to the Entrepreneur 17 menu from Max's Opera Cafe registered of Palo Alto. Copyright 1985 Max's World Inc. 18.5 When fundraising for my alma mater for the University of Michigan Business School Annual Fund, I wrote a number of people and asked why they had discontinued annual giving. Their answer the only time I hear from you is when you want money. That was not the university's perception. They thought the expensive, very professionally done publications were showing their givers how valid their help was, but perception of the giver is the reality. I learned more about keeping customers when I had breakfast with my college roommate, Howard Boisberg, who after college moved from Buffalo, New York, to Kansas City. Howard was a tremendous success in the public relations business. After breakfast I understood that a lot of Howard's success was due to walking around in the other person's moccasins. Howard related to me that most companies go to their clients on an annual basis with a written questionnaire about the quality of services. He indicated he did this regularly on an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball basis. Further, he indicated that he carefully told people well in advance exactly what everything was going to cost them. He pointed out that most divorces in professional relationships happen because of communication shortcomings rather than quality of work. He felt that was avoidable. Keeping customers Hellsberg hint. Having been a client of lots of professional organizations, I certainly subscribe to his philosophies. As a consumer of professional services, don't you deserve this treatment? Don't your customers? How often do you contact them to build a bond and learn more about their dissatisfactions? How can you improve your service to them? This applies to your internal customers, your employees or associates. They need to be convinced of the quality, pride and rightness of the behaviors of your organization. They are important because everything flows from them. Do the actual behaviors of the company, not just mission and vision statements, make them proud they work there? Asking if your associates would be proud of any action will help you make better decisions. Is this a place you would be proud to work? To be successful, have your heart in your business, and your business in your heart. Thomas Watson, 1914-1993, IBM President Mining for Diamonds Diamond Suit Don't wait until dissatisfaction arises to make love to your customer.
Take the temperature of your relationship on a regular personal basis. Diamond Suit Invest in your present customers. Don't focus on new business to the exclusion of those feeding you. Diamond Suit Keep selling your employees and associates by your actions, just as you should with your customers. Keeping Customers 19 26 A man was driving down the highway on a sweltering summer day when one of the tires on his car suddenly blew out. Stopping to search his trunk, he was relieved to find a spare tire but frustrated that he didn't find a jack. So he started hiking to the nearest gas station, more than a mile back down the road. As he walked along, drenched in sweat, he began to think perhaps the station attendant might not want to lend him a jack. After all, he already had a spare tire, and he wasn't planning to have the flat repaired right away. The station attendant really didn't have anything to gain by helping him. The farther the man walked, the hotter and angrier he became, directing all his discomfort at the station attendant, who he was now convinced would surely refuse to lend him a jack. By the time he got to the gas station, the man was so steamed about the attendant refusing to lend him a jack on this miserable, hot day that he grabbed the startled gas station attendant by his shoulders and demanded, why won't you lend me that jack? At Hellsberg Diamonds, we called this the jack story, and we used it to illustrate a key customer service challenge, the angry and suspicious customer. So many consumers have been mistreated that by the time they get to you, they already anticipate mediocre to terrible service. They may feel awkward asking for help or be so certain their needs will be ignored that they are complaining customers, your greatest opportunity Hellsberg hint. Can be defensive and even combative. But they also pose great opportunities to nurture strong relationships that transform unhappy critics into loyal customers and boosters. In fact, I firmly believe the best customers you may ever have will be the ones who came to you angry but were disarmed by your willingness to listen and to respond sympathetically to their complaints. They leave feeling special because you went out of your way to help resolve their problems. These are the customers who return again and again because they know you care about them and want them to be happy. I remember a woman who marched into Hellsberg Diamonds in Des Moines, Iowa, carrying a broken piece of Melmac dinnerware. We sold thousands of sets of Melmac at $29.95 each, along with a lifetime guarantee against breakage. Despite the guarantee, the customer's demeanor made it clear she believed the store would look for a way to weasel out of replacing the item. Instead, our store manager, L.W. Montgomery, listened attentively as the woman expressed her displeasure, putting her at ease. He then told her how sorry he was that she was inconvenienced and, without another word, rushed into a storage room and produced a replacement. The woman was so pleased with this unconditional effort to retain her as a loyal customer that she lingered in the store and bought a watch. Perhaps she needed the watch, but she wouldn't have had to buy it at Hellsberg's. She certainly wasn't in the mood to buy a watch when she steamed into our store. The Lesson Provide prompt and courteous service and you will win over customers for life. Later, I jokingly suggested to Mr. Montgomery that maybe we should put an extra piece of broken Melmac in every box of dinnerware we sold. Then, we would have other chances to prove we stood behind our Hellsberg guarantees. Of course, we wouldn't really do that. But the point is to find every opportunity to show your customers you want to take care of them. Rather than be reluctant about resolving a customer's problem, do it with joy. Thank your customer for taking the time and your complaining customers, your greatest opportunity 21. Trouble to complain. Dad always said, if you're going to take care of the customer anyway, why not get the benefit? How right he was. A recent Wall Street Journal article explained the incredible value of making the angry customer happy compared with the value of the loyal customer. The point, loyalty is far more valuable than mere satisfaction. The FedEx concept of calculating the lifetime value of loyalty, that is, $20,000 per year times 20 years is a $400,000 customer, dramatically portrays the concept. Be proud of the fact that unhappy customers think enough of you to express their unhappiness. 
The biggest losses to your business are the customers who never come back to complain about a perceived problem. Instead, they tell all their friends that they'll never deal with that lousy company again. One study I read estimates that one unhappy customer tells 18 other people about a bad experience. What a huge missed opportunity. I much prefer that formerly unhappy customers tell their friends how we fix their problems. The unhappy customer who tells you he or she is unhappy is a treasure to be coddled and potentially far more valuable than the satisfied customer. Consider spreading this feeling among your associates so they can consider the unhappy customer a real opportunity rather than a problem to be solved. The object is not to satisfy the customer but to delight the customer. Anonymous Mining for Diamonds Diamond Suit Always Realize the Need to Empathize with Your Customers Use the Jack story to illustrate this to your associates. Diamond Suit Embrace Unhappy Customers, who have the potential to become your loyal, not just satisfied, boosters. Diamond Suit Satisfy and Rectify with a Smile If you're going to take care of them anyway, why not get the benefit? 22 Managing 7. When the company started expanding to neighborhood shopping districts right after World War II, many said it did not make sense, but Dad saw that our competition hadn't really tapped the markets. In some markets, what passed for jewelry stores were glorified watchmaking shops. Hellsberg Diamonds went in with full-line jewelry stores, many of which turned out to be highly successful. Among my own forays, I got the company into the mail-order hearing aid business. This related, or so I thought, to a successful mail order division we were operating at the time. Somehow, I came up with the idea of using mailing lists of older people and offering them a hearing aid for $29.95. The venture was a sure winner, very predictable, a numbers game of simply anticipating the percentage of orders we'd get from the solicitations we sent out. What was not anticipated is that hearing aids are a very individual item, like trying on shoes. We sold 40,000 hearing aids at $29.95. Over two-thirds came back because they didn't work for everyone. What I did learn was that by being a little calmer and more mature we could have sold a few hundred and waited to see the whole story. A test includes the whole cycle, including waiting for all the returns. Of course. I failed to hear dad when he repeatedly said, a lot of these are coming back, after he passed the shipping dock managing risk Hellsberg in 23. Daily. I guess I predated the dot dot com phenomenon fortunately the whole world did not know. The failed venture didn't affect our core jewelry business and we were able to exercise an option to return unsold hearing aids to the manufacturer. We had negotiated that option up front as a way to reduce the risk to us of going into a brand new business one we clearly didn't understand. What could have been a disaster for us turned out to be far less damaging because of the safety net we had from the option to return unsold merchandise. Successful companies learn to manage risks. The risk that I might fall doesn't stop me from skiing, however. I love to ski, despite, and possibly to some extent because of, the risks. In retail, a new store always involves risk. However, there were ways we could minimize it. If a jeweler was doing $2 million per year in the mall, we knew there was business to be had if we opened in that mall. To further reduce the risks of making mistakes in pricing, advertising, or merchandising, we studied the market extensively. But at the end of the day, we found that our key success factor was people. We believed in our people. We felt they knew how to operate a store better than anyone in the business, so we decreased the risks inherent in reaching into a new market by transferring in proven managers and associates from successful stores. We were careful to assess risks in terms of several criteria. What is the amount of risk we can take at the present time? How important is the opportunity? Are we betting the farm or just the lower 40 acres? Levels of risk vary with the magnitude of the effort. On occasion all of us in business misjudge the chances for success of a particular effort. Develop the absolute worst case scenario and see if you can handle it financially and 24 managing. 
emotionally, leave a margin of safety for the unpredictable recessions, floods, fires, droughts, and September 11th. A level of pretesting can also mitigate the risk of a new venture. For example, when we wanted to test a new radical idea, we learned to test it first. Then we could focus on correcting and fine-tuning the procedures. Fail small and succeed big became my mantra at some too late date. The new idea always involves adjustments, that is, grow the idea after debugging. When possible, toe dipping is the way to go in starting new ventures. You also can minimize your risks by thoroughly studying your market. You can learn a lot from your competitors' successes. You cannot always judge your potential for success by the lack of success of others. If someone else isn't making money in a particular market, it doesn't mean that you can't. Perhaps your competitors simply haven't done a good job of exploring all the possibilities of the market. Oddly, with the advent of the covered malls we, the third generation Hellsbergs, went to sleep and were very late into the game. We nearly destroyed the company by our tardiness but were lucky enough, with tremendous effort, to recover the fumble and run it to the end zone. We finally realized that we could be successful and manage the risks. We had one mall-based jewelry store in Overland Park, Kansas, a suburb of Kansas City, and sales at that store were growing stronger all the time. We had first-rate management and service-oriented sales associates, and we knew how to price merchandise attractively. So we forged ahead with multiple mall locations in our markets. In Cinderella City Shopping Center in the Denver area we learned that an unknown jeweler could do business in a new market with a great team and a good location. Our reward was huge, resulting in virtually unlimited growth opportunities for the company. Our average sales per store grew in volume to more than $2 million by the time we sold the company in 1995. At the time we had grown to 143 stores, mostly mall-based. Managing Risk 25 Take calculated risks. That is quite different from being rash. George S. Patton, 1885-1945, General, War Hero You Miss All the Shots You Never Take. Wayne Gretzky, Professional Hockey Player Mining for Diamonds Diamond Suit You Can't Avoid Risk. You can minimize risk by weighing the worst possible outcome against the potential for rewards. Diamond suit you are always taking risk, whether changing or not changing. Diamond suit carefully think of ways to reduce your risk when you are entering into a new venture. Diamond suit sticking with the business you know reduces risk. Diamond suit remember, you don't know what you don't know. Diamond suit your biggest risk may be not taking one. 26 Managing 8. One of the worst plans I ever instituted was having managers act as owners by rewarding them purely on a profit basis. This plan ultimately backfired because some store managers became excessively concerned with overhead rather than sales. One manager worried about cutting the light bill, others focused on inventory, keeping it extremely low because of charges for carrying costs. Profit as the only yardstick gave managers incentive to concentrate on some of the wrong things and misfocus their efforts. This changed in 1970 when Martin Ross joined the company as executive vice president. He teamed with Ron Acheson, our vice president for operations. That wise and extraordinarily talented team decided the corporate office should control payroll and expenses and let the store managers concentrate only on sales, sales, and sales. That did it. The stores focused only on sales, which drove average volume ever higher, helping the company grow in a major way. Understanding the importance of profit and sales volume in business was one of the hardest concepts for me to fully comprehend. Thankfully, I was fortunate enough to work with people who knew the importance of balancing each. What about executive management? Should profit be the be all and end all for them? Absolutely not. After 39 years of learning in business, I see my associates' tremendous wisdom in should incentives be based on profit or volume. Hellsberg Hint 27 Deciding bonuses should be based on both sales volume and net profit. 
No one should be working on a pure profit bonus. It encourages short-term thinking. Therefore, we created bonuses based partly on profit and partly on volume. Profits are short run and volume is long run. If your sales volume is climbing, and you are not giving the merchandise or services away, then you've either added customers or are making better customers out of your present ones or doing both. The increase has everything to do with your customers buying decisions. It means you and your associates are doing a better job. Your customers are voting. Sales are vital to your company's future. Profit is certainly a necessity. However, profit alone can be a dangerous measurement and can lead to decisions that don't pay off in the long run. Balance between both is key. Let all your things have their places, let each part of your business have its time. Benjamin Franklin, 1706-1790, statesman, writer, and scientist. Mining for diamonds Diamond suit profit is short run. It is the byproduct of a job well done. Diamond suit sales volume is long run. Building growing, profitable sales volume in existing entities, stores, factories, etc., is paramount to success, in retail this is called a same-store sales increase. Diamond suit focus on sales or both profit and sales, depending on who is receiving the incentive and their level of control on sales or profits. 28. Managing 9. Irwin, a brilliant consultant and CPA, visited Hellsbergs and for a princely sum for those days, $100 a day, looked at our operations and made suggestions. Because of the quality of his suggestions, we invited him for a second visit, but when the bill came this time it was for $300. I called him and said, Irwin, I don't understand this bill. His reply was, you didn't do any of the things I talked to you about during my first visit. I got my whipping. Irwin made his point. There was no use spending our money and his time if we weren't going to move on any of his suggestions. He was no more anxious to waste our money than we were. The old story about consultants borrowing your watch, telling you the time, and then keeping your watch can be valid. Consultants should be checked out like any other hire of equal importance. We sometimes found outsiders could bring something to the party, but the key is implementation. If your team is resentful and not receptive or if no timetable and follow-up on new ideas or procedures are set up, you will be wasting precious time and money. What is the right way to bring in a consultant? Plant the seeds well in advance that you may want to get some outside help on a particular area of the business on a one-to-one -one basis with those most involved. They are closer than you are to the problems, dealing with them on a daily basis. They can best consultants, bane or bargain. Hellsberg Hint 29 Define the challenge. To get the greatest benefit, including ideas your own team will bring up that may be even better, discuss in depth the suggestions made by the consultant and the implementation of them. Put in more agony, get more ecstasy. A good deal of this also applies to your paid and unpaid advisors, whether they are friends or mentors. Their time is precious and if you don't really value their thoughts, why waste their time as well as your own? Time is your most valuable asset. The bank will give you more money back at the end of the year if you put it in a certificate of deposit but your time cannot be increased. Change is a door that can only be opened from the inside. Terry Neal Mining for Diamonds Diamond Suit Remember Irwin Don't use time or money if you don't plan to move on some suggestions. Diamond Suit Analyze each idea separately, talking each through with others. The ideas may stimulate other or better ideas from the group. Diamond suit be action-oriented. List what steps are to be taken, who is responsible, and milestone and completion dates. Review progress at regular meetings with the group in attendance. Diamond suit if the attitude of your insiders is resentment, jealousy, or anger, do not waste your time on consultants. You need team backing. Diamond suit the biggest danger is an interested attitude on the part of your team and no progress. You need babies, not labor pains. 
the weekly or monthly follow-up and progress report is an absolute necessity. 30. Managing 10. Barnett, whenever you go out of town, everything around here runs great, my colleagues used to kid me. Sure they said it tongue-in-cheek, at least I think so. But I took it as a compliment. Knowing of my lack of immortality, I have always felt if I did my job right, my disappearance would not harm the company. I believe that has been proven as Hellsberg Diamonds has continued to grow and has achieved new profit records since we sold to Berkshire Hathaway. If you can say that if you fell dead tomorrow, your company would prosper quite nicely without you, it's a sign that you have been a good leader. When I sold to Warren Buffett, I felt sure that Hellsberg Diamonds would just keep getting better. It didn't need me to succeed. That's one of the reasons Buffett bought us. And after he did, he didn't make one change in the management. A tremendous amount of research went into the excellent Jim Collins book Good to Great. One of the surprising revelations about the companies that went from good to great was the humility of so many of the leaders. In many cases they are not the charismatic celebrity leaders you might expect. Most are names you would not even recognize. Many large companies falter because their leaders never establish a succession plan. But small companies and entrepreneurial ventures also can take this lesson to heart. If the soul of keeping your ego in check Hellsberg in 31. The company is wrapped around the entrepreneur, its long-term survival is questionable. In fact, entrepreneurs who put their own ego before the company's welfare aren't thinking about the people who are left behind, who helped build the company and have a stake in its future. Leaders who believe their companies would go to seed without them ought to be boiled in oil. I think it's more a feather in your cap if you can brag the business will keep growing long after you're gone because of all the talented people you hired who don't need you to tell them what to do next. Just because your name is on the door of a corner office doesn't mean you have a corner on the truth. A lot of so-called business gurus preach that ego is good that it ain't bragging if you done it. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. It is counterproductive, and a false sense of bravado. People who have a healthy confidence in their abilities don't have to flaunt their egos. Ego simply gets in the way. One of the more perplexing and unfortunate manifestations of success is the inability to handle it. In fact, success can be far more difficult to handle than failure. I know, I've experienced both. For the record, I still prefer success, even with all its challenges. One unfortunate side effect can be a growing inability to listen to others and a belief in the permanent correctness of whatever you have started in motion. It's as if there is an invisible fungus that grows over the ears of some successful business people that tragically blocks their ability to listen. People with out-of-control egos often can't stand to have other smart people around. So they lose those people, and are the worse for it. I love the thought that God gave us Mozart to keep us all humble. I've been blessed with many opportunities to remain humble and I do believe being the dumbest guy in the room can be the smartest thing you can do as a leader. I've never kidded myself. Our business really began to perk when I hired people smarter than me. Often, all I had to do was get out of their way. When you find these great people, they make your dreams come true, and then they go beyond your dreams. If you don't care who gets the credit, you can get anything done. 32 Managing The wicked leader is he who the people despise. The good leader is he who the people revere. The great leader is he who the people say, we did it ourselves. Lao Tzu, C604, C531 BCE, Chinese Taoist philosopher Big People Grow, Little People Swell. BC Hellsberg, Sister mining for diamonds diamond suit a dangerous side effect of success can be a growing inability to listen to the valuable advice of others. Diamond suit ego can create a barrier between you and the smart people you need to help you build success. Diamond suit if you don't care who gets the credit, you can make your dreams come true. Keeping your ego in check 33. 34 11 one day in 1970 while visiting our store in Oklahoma City's Crossroads Mall, Jim Fisher, the store manager, 
asked me to step outside with him. When we were alone, he asked me not to mention to his staff that we had set a monthly sales goal of $20,000 for his store. At first I was puzzled. Jim was one of our best managers. Surely, a $20,000 monthly goal was within his capabilities. Jim must have sensed my surprise, for he broke into a smile. Then he explained, to my delight, that not only was $20,000 not a problem, but he and his Oklahoma City associates had set their own monthly sales goal at $40,000, twice the company's goal. His team hit $38,000 in sales, 90% above anything the general office had expected of Jim and his energetic sales staff. Talk about setting high expectations for yourself and your associates. Jim's experience underscored for me the power of setting high but realistic goals. If you set your expectations high enough, you are reaching for the stars. You may just hit the moon. Goals allow you to budget your time, set deadlines, establish priorities, and assign responsibilities. Tangible goals also give you the ability to measure your performance. For instance, members of Jim's sales team knew exactly what was expected, right down to dollars of sales needed per hour by each individual. The expectations were clear, attainable, and measurable. Setting specific measurable goals Hellsberg hint. The goal wasn't just to improve sales, it was to make $40,000 in sales. Setting individual goals encourages associates to take active roles in making the company successful. Making goals measurable allows you to reward associates and celebrate their successes. Another great lesson I learned from Jim is that 9 times out of 10 your associates will set their own goals higher than those you would set for them. Here are a few other things to remember about goals, they have to be tangible and realistic. They have to be measurable. They have to be met by a deadline. They have to be communicated clearly to everyone. They should be rewarded when they are met or exceeded. They should be limited in number, not more than 3 to achieve a bonus so that focus can be maintained. The person who makes a success of living is the one who sees his goal steadily and aims for it unswervingly. Cecil B. DeMille, 1881-1959, film director and producer Mining for Diamonds Diamond Suit set your goals high. Reach for the stars. You may just hit the moon. Diamond Suit goals allow you to measure how far you've come. Diamond Suit never, never tell anyone to do their best. Give specific expectations. Setting specific measurable goals 35. 36 12 Early in the growth of our company, we began implementing rules, believing this was a good way to avoid recurrence of misdirected actions. When something went wrong or someone screwed up, we added another rule. It got to the point where the main thing growing was the list of rules. Associates were afraid to act on their own for fear they'd make a mistake, but they were so nervous they made mistakes anyway. Finally, someone pointed out that all these rules were building up this ugly scar tissue of policies that discouraged people rather than encouraged them. We saw the light. Although we retained strong expectations for our stores and for our associates, we threw out meaningless rules that prevented the self-starters from applying their own talents and resourcefulness to meet, and more often exceed, expectations. We realized that the people who worked for us must be talented, or why else would we have hired them? Why not believe in their abilities to make things happen? Rather than fearing they would make mistakes, our associates began to express to us that they felt trusted when they made many of their own decisions. We made sure we recognized their efforts so that they knew someone was aware of their triumphs, because, in truth, if you don't provide positive feedback for their efforts, many of your associates will eventually be thinking, oh, what's the use? Recognition can be as simple as telling salespeople they handled that customer in a caring manner. Believing in people Hellsberg hint. The rich reward for you is that when your associates are motivated to stretch their abilities and contribute to the success of the organization, they will inspire you to accomplish even more. 2. It's a variation of the adage, treat others the way you wish to be treated. If this all sounds Pollyannish, 
No, there will be disappointments, sometimes you just have to grit your teeth. But if you believe in people, you will on occasion, depending on the risk and the reward, willingly allow them to fail. If someone else's idea isn't as good as yours, but it's still okay, you're often better off allowing it done his or her way. Quality of execution is far more important than the idea. In order to succeed in an increasingly complex business world, entrepreneurs need the talents of everyone in the organization. Believe in the abilities of others and let them grow and perform at their best. Helping others harvest their triumphs will allow you to achieve more success than you could hope for by insisting everything be done your way. On those inevitable occasions when your faith in an individual is disappointed, take a deep breath. Believe me, many others will delight you by exceeding all expectations. A basic need of every human being is to feel appreciated. That means more than just being understood, which is important, too. What I'm talking about is being valued for who you are, what you stand for, and what you do to make things better. Your clients and suppliers want to know that you value their relationships. Your customers want to know that you care about them. Most of all, your associates want to know that you believe their talents contribute to the success of the organization. But to be able to show appreciation, you have to believe in people. An abiding belief in people is essential to your mental health as well as the health of your business. If you are afraid your suppliers are ripping you off, you might approach them with suspicion. If you think your customers are taking advantage of you, you might treat them like trespassers. If you think your employees are cheating you, you believing in people 37. Might micromanage their every move. Pursue this negative behavior long enough and there's a good chance you'll become paralyzed with a galloping case of paranoia, and bring the progress of the organization to a grinding and painful halt. The criteria of emotional maturity the ability to deal constructively with reality the capacity to adapt to change a relative freedom from symptoms that are produced by tensions and anxieties the capacity to find more satisfaction in giving than receiving the capacity to relate to other people in a consistent manner with mutual satisfaction and helpfulness the capacity to sublimate to direct one's instinctive hostile energy into creative and constructive outlets the capacity to love William C. Menninger, MD. 1899 to 1966 co-founder the men Iger foundation mining for diamonds diamond suit individuals need to be appreciated think of how you or your business expresses appreciation as a key part of your responsibility diamond suit don't overemphasize rules consider fostering a culture that shows belief in the ability of the individual to take the right action Diamond suit don't be deterred by rare experiences when your belief in someone results in disappointment. Diamond suit bitterness will be highly counterproductive to your future success. Follow the divorced man who said, I am not bitter. I will not pay that price. 38 Managing 13 Jim, not his real name, a potential landlord, was a rather rotund fellow, and as he stared out the window and loudly enjoyed his popcorn, we, an unknown company, pitched him on the amazing benefits to his shopping centers if he would put a Hellsberg diamonds in them. We were unable to break his fascination with his popcorn and apparently some tree visible from the window. After we left the suite where his company was promoting and leasing their centers, we agreed to continue to follow Dad's maxim, never burn a bridge with anyone even if they treat you like a fence post. We would theorize that next week he would be our most important landlord and we would be working together. This is one of the most valuable lessons dad gave us and we never had reason to regret treating people like they wanted to be treated and that sometimes included not treating them like they treated us. This policy can save you lots of regrets and probably lots of time wasted in thinking about what your reaction should be. Like all rules, this has an exception. If your customer is abusing your associate consider very nicely and softly telling them that you cannot serve them properly. Never burn a bridge Hellsberg Hint 39. You can always give them hell in the morning. Tom Murphy, former boss of Cap City slash ABC, as quoted by Warren Buffett in real life the most practical advice for leaders is not to treat pawns like pawns, nor princes like princes, 
but all persons like persons. James McGregor Burns, author, historian, 1970 Pulitzer Prize winner mining for diamonds Diamond suit treat everyone as they want to be treated. Diamond suit disregard their treatment of you or your associates. Diamond suit build the story in your mind that they will be terribly important to you in the future. Diamond suit exception, if a customer is abusing your associate in the extreme, weigh the possibility of firing the customer. I did it once in 39 years. 40 Managing 14 One bitterly cold January 11th in the mid-1960s, our executive vice president, J.B. Grossman, my brother Charles, and I went to the First National Bank of Kansas City to make our routine loan. We needed to cover the checks, sent the day before, to our suppliers for the immense amount of merchandise we had bought for the Christmas season. We had a long-standing relationship with First National going back about 30 years. We had gotten the usual letter reassuring us that a $500,000 line of credit was available to us when, as, and if needed. We hardly noticed the last paragraph of the letter which would rescind the bank's obligation if our creditworthiness changed. To our shock and surprise, the bank refused to loan us the money. One particular director of the bank felt we were not creditworthy. After getting over the shock of this situation, we immediately drove to Security National Bank in Kansas City, Kansas, where the Bridenthal family had served dad for untold years. Morris Bridenthal, Jr. did have one question for us, how much do you want? It seemed a matter of seconds for us to obtain the money to back up those checks in flight at that very moment. We probably did not deserve the loan. In fact, I heard that Mr. Bridenthal, Sr. told his board, their dad learned how to make money and those boys will learn how to. The risk that day was ruining our reputation and credit rating in the industry. We came to the precipice and were saved planning for disaster markets Hellsberg Hint 41. By the two supplier principle. When at death's door, you may be saved by a relationship. We were. The Security National Bank never lost a penny doing business with Hellsberg Diamonds. Their friendship never wavered and you can imagine our loyalty. Did we continue to do business with both banks? Yes, absolutely. Never burn a bridge was our mantra. And we still wanted two suppliers. When there is no urgency is the time to concern yourself with two suppliers for critical matters. Plants burn, suppliers go bankrupt, floods, earthquakes, and tornadoes occur as well as mergers and sellouts that change the landscape radically. Going to a second source when you are desperate, and the service or product you need is in short supply, will not work. Any good supplier will take care of his own customers before adding new business. The best preparation for tomorrow is to do today's work superbly well. Sir William Osler, 1849-1919, leading 19th century physician, teacher, and historian go off to the house of thy friend, for weeds choke the unused path. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1882, author, poet, philosopher mining for diamonds diamond suit having more than one supplier for each critical need provides you with options and security. Diamond suit building personal relationships with suppliers when appropriate can save your bacon at crunch time. Diamond suit different suppliers have different strengths and weaknesses, why not let them complement each other, fill in for each other's weak areas. Diamond suit get second sources now, when you do not need them. 42 Managing 15 A number of years ago, Peter Drucker wrote a fantastic column for the Wall Street Journal about cure-alls in business. Cutting costs and redoubling present efforts, he wrote, wouldn't necessarily cure your business problems. If the world no longer wants to buy buggy whips, cutting payrolls and a layer of middle management is not going to create long-term success. Although these steps may increase short-term profits, they are just band-aids for what really ails the company. If you stall the real cure, you may hasten your company's demise, we did stall and almost demised. At Hellsberg Diamonds, the 60s were tough years with declining volumes and profits. 
We became addicted to promotions like free tea sets with a purchase like heroin it started out as a rare promotion and finally we did these costly events monthly. Our customer became educated and waited for the promotion we were trying to make a dead horse work and he refused. We finally quit these events cold turkey but though that helped, no miracle ensued. Then in a fit of desperation, we entered the licensed department business operating jewelry departments in discount stores. We actually compounded Mr. Drucker's felony first trying to revive the dead downtown stores, then taking the wrong turn for Act 2. Turnaround time at Hellsberg Diamonds Hellsberg Hint 43. Ultimately, and just in time we found our fit with the malls and closed 38 out of the 39 locations including stores and lease departments moving virtually exclusively to malls. Life, of course, is never that simple. The two giants of the business, Zale Jewelers and Gordon Jewelers, were going into nearly every mall being built with either one or two stores, they each operated higher-end divisions as well as their basic stores. With far more understanding and foresight than yours truly, they built tremendous loyalty with the developers of the malls. Their leases enabled developers to borrow on them to build the projects. I could only respect this and, at the time, I just said that I hoped someday we would be in that position with the landlords ourselves. On a cab ride from the airport to the hotel in New York at an early International Council of Shopping Centers convention, I shared a cab with a Kansas City developer, Paul Kopakin. I asked for his definition of a good tenant. Of course his definition included the payment of more rent. Since all mall rents are based on the hire of a dollar minimum or a percentage of sales, the higher the sales, the more rent for the landlord. If our store could do $1 million in the same footage as the competitor who did $500,000, our rent would be $50,000 and his $25,000, rents were then generally 5% of sales. If the minimum guaranteed rent was $15,000, we would both be paying overage rents ours would be far more profitable to the property owner. These numbers date back to 1967. Our goal became, to be the highest dollar volume per square foot jeweler in each mall. This made us interesting to the landlords and we finally got some credibility as a good tenant. 44 Managing Flops are part of life's menu, and I'm never a girl to miss out on a course. Rosalind Russell, 1907-1976, actress of stage and screen mining for Diamonds Diamond Suit Decide Where You Want to Go, and then map the course. Diamond Suit don't let short-term thinking get in the way of long-term progress. Diamond Suit plan for long-run success, not short-run profits. Diamond Suit treat the illness, not the symptoms. Turnaround time at Hellsberg Diamonds 45. 46-16 in the 1970s, Marty Ross, one of our most innovative executives ever, wanted to get rid of our long-established but increasingly cumbersome practice of financing our own receivables. The industry had handled its own credit for years, and skeptics didn't believe a jeweler could survive without extending in-house credit to customers. Because Marty, one of the early leaders of what is now called Circuit City, came out of the appliance industry, he wasn't influenced by the skeptics. Even so, the stakes were high in terms of loss of interest income and fees from the outside providers of credit. So Marty chose one of our best store managers to test his idea that jewelry stores could make more money if they focused on selling diamonds and left the credit business and interest income to banks and other lenders who were experts in such things. Now, you have to know that the manager Marty chose, Cecil Williamson, who managed our store in the Blue Ridge Mall in Kansas City, could make anything work. You could set diamonds upside down and Cecil could still sell them. But that was the point. Marty wanted his test to succeed, and with Cecil as the manager of the initial test, they fine-tuned the procedures to make the policy work. In fact, it worked very well. Cecil's success rippled through the company, as Marty showed other managers what worked and what didn't. This type of testing and evangelizing became central to our success, Testing new ideas, stacking your deck for success Hellsberg hint. 
and became one of the reasons we were able to move quickly in the marketplace. After our test of outsourcing customer credit, we could now say to other Hellsberg stores, it has proved to be successful. As each of our stores began to implement the new system, our total focus on buying and selling diamonds, and not on being in the banking business, brought incalculable dividends. Today, companies like General Electric and other private label credit sources are providing credit for many prestigious and successful retailers. At one time I believed the best way to evaluate whether a new product or concept would work in one of our stores was to simply test the idea in an average store with an average staff. My simplistic and erroneous thinking was that if the great new idea could be made to work in an average store, it could work in all of our stores. Then I learned a better way, one that made a big difference for our company, although perhaps it wasn't exactly the business school method. What I learned was that winning entrepreneurs build success into the way they test new ideas or products by having their best people take on the challenge. Doing everything you can to try to ensure success is a different way to test. You are, in effect, setting a standard for accomplishment everyone else can learn from and emulate. Can we make it to the moon? Not by sending average astronauts. No way. You send up your best astronauts and prove getting to the moon can be done. Many business people are taught that when you test products or ideas, you have to set up a situation that eliminates factors that could bias the results. They're taught they should have a test group and a control group for comparison, and that they should control as many variables as possible to get a true contesting new ideas, stacking your deck for success 47. Harrison. These guidelines are great for folks who need scientifically valid results and have time to wait for them. In practice, however, sometimes you have to take intelligent shortcuts in order to get a winning idea to market. It might not work for your business, but it allowed us to test products and ideas quickly and, at the same time, get excellent feedback. If the new idea was implemented first by our best people, we actually learned more than if we did it the business school way. You have your best people be the pioneers to prove whether it's doable or not, and then have them evaluate and refine the best techniques for getting it done. This method of testing resulted in several benefits for us, we had proof that the idea could work, or not work, as the case may be, at least it would under the best circumstances. We were able to judge the potential of the new concept for the future, if the best manager got only small gains, the potential of the concept was likely very limited. We got feedback on what worked, what didn't, and what should be changed. The best managers could help refine the process so that it could be standardized, documented, and used in training. Our smartest people found the best way to apply the concept in the practical world, and we got a sense of what the real costs were. If the test worked, we had the buy-in of the store personnel who first tested it. They could evangelize the idea among other stores. The best managers achieved results that other managers could then strive to achieve. We had a benchmark against which to set high standards, and we knew those high standards were achievable. 48 Managing For truly motivated people success is necessary not an option. Julia Serving, Dr. J. Professional basketball player only a fool tests the depth of the water with both feet. African proverb mining for diamonds diamond suit ensure success. Set up best case examples for others to replicate. Diamond suit fine tune the initial test. Diamond suit set the standard for success. Diamond suit roll out the new concept slowly and carefully when it works. You will still be ironing out wrinkles along the way. Keep fine tuning. Testing new ideas, stacking your deck for success 49. 5017 My wife, Shirley, and I arrived at the airport luggage area with our friends, Fred and Lillis Beal, and watched for our bags to get off the conveyor. When Lillis's smallest bag didn't show up, she got very upset. It was the only one that didn't show up and, of course, it was the most valuable. It contained her jewelry. Her husband assured her it had been stolen because they took the right one. As she became more and more upset, I walked up to her and said, Lillis, 
It ain't cancer. 20 minutes passed. Two things happened. First, the bag showed up. Second, Lillis came up and said, Thanks you really helped me. Such things need to be held in perspective. Losing keys, glasses, and wallet on an almost daily basis is not something to get terribly upset about, notwithstanding the fact that I often lose them and sometimes get very irritated. It also means the challenges in business should be welcomed because that is why you are there. A problem solver is what you are. There is a big difference between fatal illnesses and business problems. Keep that difference in mind. How to avoid overreacting to problems Hellsberg hint. A bend in the road is not the end of the road, unless you fail to make the turn. Anonymous mining for diamonds diamond suit it ain't cancer. Diamond suit keep things in perspective. Diamond suit enjoy the challenges your business presents. How to avoid overreacting to problems 51. 5218 An MBA candidate told my class that she detested her company after they gave her a special day off. Why, when the company had done something nice for all the employees, was she so angry? When asking how to explain the lack of service on that Monday, she was told merely to explain that the phones were down. The next week I thanked her for sharing that with the class. It appeared she got something very positive, a day off, but what she really got was a very negative message about the integrity of the company. She knew that if they would tell her to lie to customers, they would certainly be capable of lying to her. She quit her job the next week. This reminded me of the expression both my folks repeatedly told me, if they'll steal for you, they'll steal from you. The MBA candidate knew the company would lie to her if they told her to lie to the customers. Similarly, if you expect others to cheat your customers, you can expect them to cheat your company as well. You just can't have it both ways. I'm convinced that one of the greatest things you can do for your team, your business, and yourself is to operate with absolute integrity. Integrity, a long-run profit maker Hellsberg hint. Who steals my purse, steals trash but he that filches from me my good name, robs me of that which not enriches him, and makes me poor indeed. William Shakespeare, 1564-1616, author, playwright, poet mining for diamonds If you operate with integrity, diamond suit you will be helped greatly in building long-term success. Diamond suit you can always look yourself in the mirror. Diamond suit your associates will love the company for this attitude. Diamond suit you will draw the right kind of people to the company as your associates spread the word about their workplace and feel comfortable recommending it to others. Integrity, a long-run profit maker 53. 5419 the store was doing poorly as far as sales went. Dot, we would target executive visits repeatedly. The crew was good and the store was neat and well located. The team was trying very hard to make sales. Finally, one of our more creative executives visited and figured out the problem. The team was trying too hard, making customers uneasy and communicating their tension. He told them to start having fun, enjoying their customers and making them feel at home. Instead of communicating stress, communicate the atmosphere of fun. Stress is like a virus, and you can quickly spread it to your customers by being impatient, curt, pushy, and downright rude. Think of how our potential customers might have felt. They are already uncertain about making a purchase. They may also be very nervous. When people walk into a jewelry store for the first time, they are often intimidated because they don't know much about diamonds. It's easy to scare them away. Who wants more stress from an unpleasant, pushy, or haughty salesperson, especially when shopping for something like diamonds, a gift that is supposed to convey happiness and love? I quickly learned that the most important side of business is the human side so it wasn't unusual that when one of our stores wasn't meeting its sales goals, we advised the sales team to quit trying so hard and start having fun with their customers. Having fun Hellsberg hint. Here's an example of having fun with a customer. A man came into our Omaha, Nebraska, store and ordered a ring for his wife's birthday. 
but he wanted to keep the purchase a secret, and he asked the store manager to help with the surprise. The store was glad to help. The man took his wife out to eat and afterward told her, with a mischievous smile, let's go to Hellsburg's to look around. At first, his wife was taken aback, responding, Hellsburg's. You waited until the last minute to buy my present. But no sooner had they entered the store than a clerk greeted them and asked the wife to try on a new style ring that had just come in. It fit perfectly and the wife was thunderstruck. Only then did she find out that her husband had picked out the ring in advance and had it sized for her. Everyone had fun with that put-up job. And that's the way it should be. Include your customers in the fun, and build a relaxed, light-hearted culture. If you think this sounds like Herb Kelleher and Southwest Airlines approach, great. When I'm a customer, I don't want to be treated like a wallet with legs. Fun is contagious. Fun energizes your sales staff and attracts customers into a store. And what a pleasant shock to a sales team, the boss told us to start having fun. That's an order anyone would want to comply with. How can you tell a fun place to shop? Smiling clerks are busily helping customers, answering their questions, making recommendations, and complimenting their choices. And they do not just talk about things the customer can buy. They get the customer talking about the big fish he caught, her vacation trip, or other unrelated stuff. They are making friends of their customers. There are all kinds of ways to share fun with your customers. One of the best things we did was to invite shoppers to bring their food into the store with them. Ice cream cones. Hot dogs with mustard. No problem. The standard store signs in a mall say, no food or drink. Ours stated, your food and drink are welcome here. We were trying to say, we are here on your terms. We are different. When couples bought wet having fun 55. Ding rings, some stores commemorated that day with a photo of the couple for the store album. After all, they weren't buying toasters. They were acquiring memories they would cherish. Do you have to be creative to have fun? It helps, but it's not necessary. Most of the time you just need to be friendly. Compliment a customer's tie or dress. Perform small favors. We cleaned customers' rings free while they shopped. We put new watch batteries in at no charge. Make your customers feel welcome and at home. It may sound corny, but one of my greatest compliments was when a landlord introduced me as president of the biggest chain of mom and pop jewelry stores in America. Business is people. B.C. Hellsberg, senior mining for diamonds diamond suit if everything else seems to be working perfectly but sales are still suffering, maybe your team is trying too hard. Diamond suit create fun. Fun is contagious and it can boost productivity. It creates enjoyable experiences for you and your customers. Diamond suit the culture and atmosphere of your business may ultimately be even more important than your product. Diamond Suit Study the Southwest Airlines Approach to Creating Fun 56 Managing 20 When question time comes up at meetings where I've been a speaker, at times I'm asked, what are the best things entrepreneurs can do for their community? In truth, I think the highest priority is for you to make your company highly successful. That includes profitability. Why? First, to ensure the continuity of the business and the jobs of your associates. Second, to ensure that the company can go through tough times as well as good times. It's important to have very good earnings in the good times because you know the tough times will come when earnings decrease or disappear. The company will be more likely to survive if you've built a strong foundation. Third, if your company is profitable and you are able, Hopefully you are also willing and eager to share the good things profits can bring with your associates. This includes better benefits and more pay. Fourth, it will provide great joy for you when you are in a position to give back to your community with your time and financial ability. Although money is not the only motivator, and sometimes a highly overrated one, it's a wonderful way to keep score and it's very thrilling for an entrepreneur to share the company's good fortune with associates.
What are profits for? Hellsberg Hint 57 Giving is joyful and I always have looked at it as selfish rather than generous on my part because I enjoy it so much. One of my greatest mentors taught me that sharing is a great part of the fun in as much as you can only wear one suit at a time and eat three meals a day without getting overly glorified. At Hellsberg Diamonds we had a tradition of increasing individual earnings as much as 17% in the form of
Giving is joyful and I always have looked at it as selfish rather than generous on my part because I enjoy it so much. One of my greatest mentors taught me that sharing is a great part of the fun in as much as you can only wear one suit at a time and eat three meals a day without getting overly glorified. At Hellsberg Diamonds we had a tradition of increasing individual earnings as much as 17% in the form of Giving is joyful and I always have looked at it as selfish rather than generous on my part because I enjoy it so much. One of my greatest mentors taught me that sharing is a great part of the fun in as much as you can only wear one suit at a time and eat three meals a day without getting overly glorified. At Hellsberg Diamonds we had a tradition of increasing individual earnings as much as 17% in the form of